Otherwise, we're going to ban you from all the parties tonight. That's why I'm number one. I have all the party masters on my list. You do. <laughs> you got to wait in line if you're talking in the back. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, set this uh, conversation up a little bit. I don't know if you know Andy, but he built dashboard for the Macintosh and a few other things, including the iPhone. Uh, he was director of software for Palm, um, and now he's building a new startup. We're going to uh, show the first time really in depth. We showed it a little bit in, uh, at the web, but uh, it's pretty cool. So about two years ago, I started seeing five new patterns being fused together, right? We have uh, uh, sensors are going up exponentially. A 3D sensor a year ago used to cost $100. Today, it's $20. And in fact, just last week, I saw one for 50 cents. So numbers of sensors on us, around us, in us are going up exponentially. Hey, everybody, if you can be quiet, that'd be great. It's really rude to be talking right now. Thank you. There you go. There we go. Come With up front. Come up front. We're going to do a worldwide launch of a new startup. Come up front. Get your beer. Either that or go outside and look at the Chevy. Oh. Yeah. Now what would you pay? All right. <laughs> the numbers of wearable computers are going up exponentially. This guy started uh, Recon Instruments and is building a little computer inside the Oakley Airwave glasses. By the way, the Airwave glasses show where you are on the mountain, how fast you're going, your hang time of your latest jump, and so on. The amount of location data continues going up exponentially. Foursquare is seeing exponential rises in the databases that they're building. Waze is seeing the same thing. So is uh, uh, other services. And the amount of social data is going up exponentially. That's why we're at the Tweet House. Tweet, Twitter today has half a billion tweets. When the Tweet House started, it only had maybe 10,000 tweets a day, right? And the amount of data innovation is going up exponentially. We're seeing new kinds of databases that we've never seen before, partly because the data centers are switching from hard drive uh, media to SSD-based SSD media. And the, the architecture is changing from the old Oracle world, where you had a, one big machine with a database on it, to a horizontally scaled s system like Hadoop. eBay has 20,000 servers in their Hadoop cluster, for instance. And you fuse all those things together, and that's really the breakthrough in this age of context and what we're going to talk about with Andy, because we're fusing these five things together to bring us new capabilities. We're now getting highly personalized new kinds of products like Tap and Go, which you might not have seen yet because it's only for college kids, but they just got $5 million of funding, and it surveils you as you buy your stuff. It's for college kids, so you buy your sandwich on it, you buy your uh, uh, coffee on it, you buy your books on it, and it surveils you. It follows you around as you live your life and buy things, and then it starts suggesting things on to you as you cross geofences. It's a pretty interesting product we can talk a lot about. About. We're seeing the second thing it means for humans is we're seeing new predictive kinds of software, and it, it'll be interesting to see if if uh, Ately that we're going to show you in a second does any of this. But as we live our lives, software can now get ahead of us and tell us what's coming next. Like, hey, the party uh, is down the street; you need to leave right now, right? For businesses, we're seeing two new kinds of impacts. We're seeing. Uh, Businesses are going to need to study everything about everything. If you think about Uber, in your hand, they know everything about their business. They know where you are, where the inventory is, where the transactions are happening, where their uh, employees are, and on and on. And we're seeing that we're being forced to learn more about our customers. And we're going to talk about that, how, how Ately is going to uh, mold in uh, data from Foursquare or from Facebook and other places. We're seeing a new kind of marketing. So next year when you come back here, there's going to be a bunch of little low energy or a Bluetooth smart devices because they just rebranded these things last night. They're now called Bluetooth smart radios. These are little radios. Does anybody have a Bluetooth smart radio on them, by the way? <coughs> anybody? Anybody? Like a tile or something like that? OK. I have three of them in my back. But they're little radios that cost about 10 to thirty dollars. Do you have any, any of the any of the estimates on you? I've got the uh, yeah, my bag. Hey, oh no, wait, no, no, wait, no, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Anyways, uh, estimates are uh, little radios. We'll talk about. We're seeing a new kind of pinpoint marketing. So in the future, you're going to walk into a bike shop like this, and the bike shop app will know you're in the store, and maybe even know what display you're standing next to. And yeah, these are uh, these are some of the some of the little um, radios. 
They, by the way, these radios spit a number into the air every second. This one's spitting a number into the air every second, and it runs for about two two years on a coin battery. So, uh, a bike shop could put 50 of these in the, the bike shop, and as you walk by different displays, your iPhone or your Android phone can show you different things. Uh, Shelfbox is a company that uh, uh, won the Demo God uh, uh, award last year. They're going to put 20 of these in a store and you're going to tap into the shelf box to get coupons and other information about the display you're looking at. The uh, display over here is a, a, a company called Prime, uh, Shopperception. They're putting uh, 3D sensors over your head in a store. These 3D sensors are made, made by PrimeSense, which Apple just bought for $1.2 billion, right? Uh, these 3D sensors are so sensitive they can see your hand heading toward a box of Cheerios and see you pulling a box of Cheerios off the shelf and putting a box of Cheerios in the uh, shopping cart. Uh, we are headed into an always surveilled world and this is a really uh, deep problem for privacy and uh, uh, a real big opportunity for a lot of people. Vintech is uh, studying your social media behavior, so if you say anything about wine, they build a profile on you. Already they're seeing 1.1 million tweets a day about wine, people saying I love Sutter Home or whatnot. And now they're putting geofences around um, wineries, so if you, if you come to Napa, they're tracking your behavior around Napa and then changing the kind of customer service you can do and the kinds of uh, content that we can produce. So these are some of the radios that we're talking about. Uh, the one in the middle is Estimotes. They're about $30. Uh, they last for two years. Um, and you're going to see them all over. Baseball stadiums are going to have 65 of them before opening day. Uh, now this means a radical change to what this new contextual world means, radical changes to autom automobiles. I mean, Andy's uh, new car, he has a Chevy Volt, which you actually bought. You didn't get a free one from Chevy, did you? No, I didn't. I Look at Chump. I did it through the regular <laughs> store. But it's awesome. Yeah. But your and I'm car, not being paid to say that. Your, your car you has uh, an, an API? Yay. There you go. Right. The Chevy people like that. <laughs> uh, your car has an API on it, right? It does have an API, although I can't really do much with it yet. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, but yeah, I can get all sorts of data from my car, like miles per gallon, and last time I filled, and all sorts of stuff. How many people knew about Tesla versus the New York Times? Remember that? Yeah. So the Tesla has the capability of always surveilling you, always knowing what you're doing. In fact, Tesla, uh, Elon Musk used this against the New York Times when the New York Times gave the car a bad review. He knew that the driver had done donuts in the parking lot. He knew that the driver had turned on the AC to a full blast. He knew uh, everything about the car, and now that's available as an API that a Google Glass developer can uh, build an app. And I've seen the Tesla app, so the guy can see where his car is located and tell it to open the moonroof and all sorts of fun stuff. So we can talk all about cars, and, and we'll go outside and talk about that. We're seeing radical changes in health. Uh, you know, Google is building pills that you're going to eat and watch you from the inside. Uh, it's not just Google. I went to a research lab and they're building these pills with uh, all sorts of sensors and cameras. I have a, a little camera that's a one millimeter by one millimeter camera that's being used on surgical instruments and uh, pills like this. We're going to soon be wearing patches with m little micro needles. Up there is a, the big, big blue thing is a traditional needle that you stick in your arm. The little micro needles are little silicon needles and you put your hand on them, it feels like sandpaper, but it's, uh, it gets under the skin enough to pull out a few cells of blood to test it for sugar levels or other things. We're seeing cities change because of this, because we're carrying mobile phones around now and we have new services like Uber where the service comes to us literally to us on our mobile phone. Instacart San Francisco delivers groceries right to us. eBay now, if I forget a power supply or something, I can have a power supply delivered in less than an hour to me. The problem is this only works in an urban area where there's a high population density. At my house in Half Moon Bay, none of these services work. So we're now seeing a new kind of person that wants to live in a downtown. You know, when I grew up, my dad didn't want to live in the downtown because it was where the poverty was, where the high crime was, and where there wasn't a good place to, to raise kids. And that leads us into uh, a new kind of lack of privacy or a new definition of privacy that we always have interesting conversations about. And that, we'll talk about that outside because I want to bring up Andy up and talk about this new world.
So do you want to plug in? Yeah, I'm going to plug in. Actually, not yet, because I'm going to. Okay. That's going to be the money shot in a little bit. All right. So uh, Andy, uh, uh, you know, he, you built the dashboard. Yeah, I was building platforms for a long I'm time. I'm a platform guy. You know, I started at Apple uh, back in the 90s when Apple still had this advanced technology group, which was really just the way to flush a bunch of money uh, down the drain on big stuff. But uh, I was there for about 11 years, uh, and I came back uh, to build something called iChat. Uh, I, I, I don't know how many people are Mac people versus PC people, so I think, you know, uh, something called iChat. It's not meant to be a humble brag. That's just meant to be like a... Uh, I, I just don't know. Uh, and, and then after Dashboard, or after iChat, um, uh, me and a friend started this thing called Dashboard. Dashboard was this initial idea that we had to bring regular people into Mac OS as developers, right? Because regular people at that point were people that knew how to write JavaScript and HTML and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they didn't have to know Objective-C, but you know that was our definition of regular people back then. Uh, so we shipped that, and then um, and then a few of us got together um, and started something. Well, the iPhone that well, that actually almost came out as a humble. How many people have an iPhone, by the way? In the audience. Wow. All right. Did you know that, by the way, that you're all carrying one of those uh, Bluetooth smart radios in your iPhone, and it's not turned on, and you have no clue that you're carrying it around, and that software developers like uh, Andy are going to be able to do stuff with that in the future, like build an automatic hashtag. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's lots of cool stuff you can do, but you have to lay the infrastructure first. And platforms are all about laying the infrastructure so so people can build new experiences and, and do everything. You know, when we started the phone, we didn't actually. Uh, uh, random story. Uh, when we started the phone, Steve didn't want an API for developers. Uh, he wanted to have the most important function of any phone uh, being its ability to make phone calls. And so he didn't want any knucklehead developers getting in there and, and messing that, that potential up. Uh, but now you look at it and you're like, when was the last time you actually made a phone call? Like with your, we all do stuff like tweeting and videos and all like non-phone call stuff on it. But. Uh, that's you know being able to respond. That's Apple's thing. So since you're a platform guy and you're seeing a new platform evolve, with your car has an API, we're all on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all these new services. Some of us have Nest thermostats at home or home automation devices that uh, have an API and have, right. have attributes, right? So what we've done is hey guys in the back, Ooh. hey. We have the guy who built the fucking iPhone on stage here. Will you come up and listen to us and shut up for 15 minutes and then we can all go out and have a great party? Yeah, that's right? the voice of authority. Great. There you go. I wish I knew. You know what? I wish I knew how to do that to my teams. <laughs> I say that and I get laughed at, but that's cool. You know, I'm, not, I'm not judgy. Uh, no, but the idea for, you know, for, uh, for when we started the phone was we created all these silos of, of data. It, you know, unbeknownst to us at the time, what we created was you know one phone manufacturer to run one kind of app, and then Android sprouted up, and there's another one, and now we've got two different app ecosystems, and now we've got Windows Mobile and uh, all sorts of other different environments, which makes it real problematic for for developers to figure out where do you choose to create your new thing, right? If you want monetizable developer or uh, users, you go to iPhone. If you just want raw numbers or you like the platform better, you go to Android or whatever. And then on top of that layer of just platform, we've got Facebook and Twitter and uh, Chevy cars and Nest thermostats, all of those generate different silos of data. Nobody's really interested in helping out the other guys. Certainly Facebook and Twitter have no interest in, in making those products really work well together. So at the end of the day, you've got this class of, of, of problem where regular people not don't they want to actually do new things that have never been possible before. And they don't want to think about, am I running this app on a phone or on a TV? Is it Android or is it Samsung or is it whatever else? How do you remove all of those barriers? And then how you go back to that first thing? How do you make it accessible to real people? Not people that know JavaScript and CS and so on. Now, how do you make it really accessible? And so that's been uh, we've we've seen that problem uh, for coming. It's been in, it's been brewing for years. You, you're seeing the outputs of it right now. Uh, and so we've spent uh, we've spent about two years and lots and lots of investor money uh, trying to figure this this out. How do you solve this problem properly? Uh, and so a few of us got together. Um, you know, my co-founder, one of them, was also on the first iPhone team, uh, and the other one built the iPod design team, did BOS graphics, and he's one of the best designers in the valley. Uh, and we got together to make a thing to uh, to combat this problem. 
Uh, we're going to show you a peek today. Uh, so I'm going to show you something in a little bit. But Robert and I are going to talk about some other stuff first, I guess. Yeah. Some of the contextual uh, implications of that. Well, first I'm going to try and get this one more time. Hey, everybody in this place, either be quiet or go the hell out to the Chevy and take a look at the Chevy. Come up front and take a look at this product. This is the guy who built the iPhone, and we're going to take a worldwide first look at a really cool product. All right. Wow. So, I don't do you know how to do the, the whistle with your fingers? Like, that's a, that's, that's a thing. It's, I'm sorry, when you're so noisy, it's really hard to have a conversation. You know, we want to have a good conversation. So, um, what's going on? So, you're, you're seeing this new platform exist. We're all we're carrying mobile phones. We're, soon, we're going to get Google Glass or an Apple mm -hmm. iWatch or a Google Watch or a Samsung Watch on yeah. us. What are, what are you thinking about in terms of platform? I'm thinking in terms of how do you create a platform that spans all the platforms and how do you create services that span all the services? How do you solve that uber difficult problem? Back in the day, remember we had Flash and Flash was doing the impossible moving graphics. Today we can do that in HTML, but back in the day we couldn't do that, right? And so then we started to see the proliferation of that. Java kind of came in to do, you know, a solution to that, but but that really wasn't, I don't think, the right solution. So, you know, I'll show you in a little bit what that means to us, but in terms of the, the problem that exists, um, and now what we're looking at is a new kind of uh, technological problem, right? So we were, Robert's just been talking about all these different kinds of sensors. What happens when you have the ability to sense locality? How do you actually take advantage of that? What does that mean? What does it mean to actually understand, like, uh, you know, I would, we, we live over at Half Moon Bay, uh, and we go to the Ritz a lot. And would it be really cool to have, when I go up to the bar, they automatically know I like a Manhattan Bullet Rye up. Right. Yeah. That came out a little too easy, but <laughs> <laughs> but, but you can't have uh, who wouldn't like that. But you know that crosses that line. But really, it addresses the Ritz's need of trying to to cross that level of really uh, hyper localized service, right? So when they go in and you go to their, we we learned we actually met. We were at the bar one night, and we talked to the guy who ran marketing for all the Ritz and the lengths that they go to to create these ultra personalized experiences. Uh, has never really been replicated before in, in software. Yeah. Maybe you could argue that that's a good thing or not. I don't know, but you know they, they know based on, like you check into a room, you eat a bunch of Snickers bars, they have housekeeping that looks through your trash uh, and notices that you eat a lot of Snickers bars. And so next time you check into that property, there's a Snickers bar waiting for you on the table. So how do you, you know, but that's a really interesting, like they know lots and lots of stuff. They're meant to, they're trying to be helpful. You can obviously make the flip. You know the flip on that which is the really getting into my business it's really interesting that we're showing this in a bike shop right because uh the guy who runs this bike shop probably is not an ios developer and nope. probably doesn't know what uh, how to build a java app for android yep and probably doesn't know how to deal with all these sensors or these new radios and that they're going to put around isn't that's the problem right so when i look at you know if you're a programmer you can go to this website programmable web and there's like ten thousand different apis ten thousand different people making different accessible uh, bits and services. When I look at that, I'm like, I see opportunity, but I'm an engineer. If you're a regular person, A, you don't even know that that exists, uh, that that data is available, and then B, how the hell do you make a thing that allows you to do something with that? And then C, let's say you put all this time and energy, or let's say you got some cash to throw around, it's gonna cost you at least 10K to make a thing that does whatever specific use case that you want that that a big software developer doesn't really want to solve right because it's so specific to you so how do you solve that problem and I'm gonna show you our take Let, on that let's see it because uh, otherwise the people we're standing in line take us over we're standing between booze and everything else so I'm gonna show you plug it in yeah I'm gonna show you uh, we're doing this demo so what are over we airplay so what you're seeing is oh, a blue then. screen yeah all right, so we're airplaying this from my tablet. Uh, what you're seeing is a channel. A channel is what we create. We don't want to call them apps because apps are really heavily overloaded term. Uh, it's not a web page. It's actually a fully native experience on the phone. Uh, and and this, it's dynamic, right? Things can change instantly. This has been sitting up here. We've got a live data stream. In this particular example, you know, we had you know, we look at really specific use cases. Like you're a guy uh, who lives in New Orleans. You have all this localized knowledge about New Orleans, and you just want to be able to tell people, how would I do that? You know, how can I communicate that out? There's a couple of apps. They're very specific that you can download to to get recommendations like this. But how do you enable? 
the dude who lives in one of those really cool houses who's drunk half the time but has a couple of knowledge, you know, really cool pieces of knowledge to just broadcast and create a really neat experience around it. And, and this, unlike a WordPress blog or something like that, this is dynamic and can yes. adjust in real time based on the sensors you're near or yes. the people you're so, near. Yeah, in fact, one of the things that we showed, uh, we gave you know, a little tease at the web uh, and I built one of these things. I'm going to go into that in a little bit, but Robert and I uh, did the demo with uh, those little Estimo beacons where uh, we built a channel on stage. I'll show you how easy it is, but we built the channel and then he had a, he had a beacon and as he got closer, his head lit up, meaning we saw that he was there. And then when he got really close, the avatar for him started pulsing. And it was just a meant to just showcase real briefly what you can do. Now that pulse can be translated into all sorts of different stuff inside of Haley. But I just wanted to show you here, we have a, a couple of different things. Look at all this, this looks very custom, right? You've got a title, you've got you know some text here, although it's tempting to take the main route through. We've got the Wikipedia entry for New Orleans uh, and the time and the weather. If I hit this go button, it's going to just go to the next scene in our channel. Uh, it's doing a live query right now. I've got kind of a bit of a slow uh, internet, but and you say this is live, so you're actually pulling this data from Google Maps, and it's it's a this full is, on map. Yeah, we just did a search. We got the greatest gumbo hangouts, and you know we've got all this data that just showed up. We can tap on it and you know check out Joey K's whatever. And this is again all live as as time or weather changes, it all gets updated instantly. But all right, this is kind of interesting. Uh, we've got our, our guy down in New Orleans who's made this kind of this thing of some curated spots or it can be automatic or whatever. But what I want to show you is the power of, all right, this is our, when I say we drop down into, into how you build stuff, these are our building blocks. We've turned programming into a card game. So if you can actually play a simple game like poker, or blackjack, or anything so like that. So there's no code. There, there's, there's no zero code. In there's the no if then else statements or oh, anything like that. No, it's all cards. Yeah, I'm going to show you. Let's just make this. So we have this channel. Uh, we've got this ability to say, let's put some stuff at the bottom of the screen. Uh, wouldn't it be cool? That stuff can be anything. But you know, I really like some pictures. And uh, you know, let's get them from Flickr. And we're into we're into you know gumbo. Uh, so now we've got this scene which has some, uh, hopefully some pictures in it, and this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, enjoy. See, I'm spending more time for trying to figure out what to type than I am actually programming. Enjoy Cajun cuisine. You know, and what is this? This is going to be a bunch of food porn. All right, so we've done, <laughs> we've just done, we've done, no, we've spent more time figuring out words to say, but now when I preview the screen, here we go back to our channel. Uh, it's doing that fetch again. It's populated, figured out we're in New Orleans, and here's all those pins. Now, what's going to happen is, again, this took a little bit long time because our, our network's a little bit slow, but it's doing this fetch in real time on Flickr. Uh, it's getting us all the you know pictures about gumbo. Apparently, that's what Flickr's matching to gumbo. When I tap on one, uh, there's my Enjoy Cajun Cuisine, and there's all this stuff about gumbo. I, that's probably some like, thing. But what the important thing is, is, is we did no work. We strung together a bunch of photos that came from Flickr that required all what I wanted to know is what am I searching for? Debugging, in our case, is figuring out different search terms instead of trying to figure out how to hook everything together. You don't have to know, you know, how to do an if then, how to talk to it. No, 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 no. This is the way regular people, I think, can create stuff. And by the way, this is even, this is the advanced mode. The simple mode is where we prepackage all those cards I showed you all of this, we prepackage them up into one nice little thing. And so if you can fill out a LinkedIn profile by filling out a form, you can fill out a form that fills out all the customizable stuff of these cards, and then you get an app, a channel, out of the whole thing. It's now the magic thing. is, this is all re resolution independent. So this right. can display on a Google Glass, or on a mm -hmm. watch, or on a TV, so or on everything, you'll notice not one thing in here says, uh, I want 30 point Helvetica, blah, blah, blah. And that's because as soon as I give you that control, I've ruined the ability for us to take that experience and move it onto a piece of glass or onto, onto a smartwatch with a really tiny display. You don't have to think about it. And I don't just take this screen and make it smaller to fit on a phone. We do actually complete, we invented a whole new uh, visualization on the back end, which takes that and reflows it into something that you intended to do for your phone. Or if you want to turn this into a TV channel, one of the boxes in there is to make an autoplay. So all you do, it's a completely lean back experience where now you've got automatically panning photos on Cajun Cuisine. Uh, and they can you go anywhere from interactive up front uh, or all the way in the back, uh, completely lean back. Now where we see this going when we look at back to the sensors, wouldn't it be great to have the guy, the social media person, we actually know them, uh, at the Ritz, 
be able to whip up a completely custom experience because they're promoting the spa that day or because they want to have some really cool thing for a particular XYZ guest who's a big spender. They can do that instantly. They don't have to be a programmer. Yeah. And then take advantage of the... So tell me about some of the cards. Walk, walk me through some of the cards so I have a sense of the... Uh, the well, these are to what the programming language of this... These are all... I mean, everything here is is, uh, is fairly basic. It's all structured. You'll notice it's color-coded. Uh, the black cards are, uh, are JavaScript. They live in the cloud. We can turn these on instantly. Uh, as new people, as developers, real programmers get in there and they take one of those 10,000 APIs on, on programmable web. They turn this into a Chevy card and then I can export all of my Chevy car data into one of these things. And then what we can do, if somebody were to write a, uh, a Tesla card, well, one of our cards here would be a competition. And so then you can have miles per gallon per you know tank or whatever, if you want to compete against your buddy. I'm packing a Fitbit Force. Uh, and this is tracking my weight, my, well, my scale is tracking the weight, but this is tracking all this other data. My buddy actually works over at Jawbone on their team. We can't have a competition because we have competed with different products, and neither company is interested in making you know, that combined experience. But each one has an API. So that just comes out as a card, competition, now all of a sudden we're doing some really cool stuff. Again, no programming. So this is where it begins, and again, the definition, a platform is meant to be something that you can infinitely scale. So if you want to go ahead and make more cards, make cards all day long. Do you we'll need, make sure that do you need an work. iPad to do this, or you can do I for, do it on a desktop? Or? No, we're, for, we've, we've adopted the mobile model. Uh, desktop is nice, but I believe the best creation experience is on the tablet. The phone is a great consumption device. Uh, and I believe the TV is also a great consumption device. We'll eventually get to the point where we put it on a, on a desktop browser for consumption. Uh, but I don't really see the desktop as being a powerful player. It's not worth the resources to go into create, you know, creation experience. Yeah. You know. So this is a really a new uh, programming tool for the mobile, the contextual world, the wearable world, mm -hmm. right? And it's all meant to be completely consumer friendly. You're supposed to just have a nice, rich experience about, you, know, you see my test channels, you know, it's uh, <laughs> probably could have picked other ones. But, you know, the idea is that it's easy for you to create these things, favorite them, share them with your friends, uh, make them disposable. So if you put some energy into making a thing, it's no big problem at all if you want to just kill it six hours later. You're a band. You're playing at, uh, you're playing at some one of these places here tonight. Why wouldn't you just make a quick channel, play a couple of cards, and then the, as complicated as it gets is the rules card, which says, hey, before 6 p.m. Friday, actually we're in Austin, probably before 10 p.m. on Friday, uh, show all the lead up to the band. Where gig is 10 to 2, show live tweets, show live photos. If you're, if you're kind of a cutting edge band, you're doing live cuts of your, of your tracks right to SoundCloud. Bring all that in so people at home, who's not in your venue, can listen. And then afterwards, do the upsell, maybe some curated stuff, and then make that available and do the next thing, right? Wow. So I think that's where we go out of this. This has come a long way since you showed it in uh, December in Paris. How long is it going to be before we get it? Uh, so we're going to have it available for everybody uh, in two to three months. Uh, this is still, we got to figure out a couple of things around what's the right cards we should be providing. So we're going to open it up to, uh, to a developer, a beta list. Um, you can go ahead and sign up on the website. Uh, we will be opening it up to that list of people. Those are kind of the people, early adopters. I wouldn't really put my mom on that list, proverbial my mom on that list, but I would uh, open it up to, uh, to people who come on in and, and decide, give us feedback. Say, hey, you know what? This doesn't really make any sense. I really want it. This would be great if I just had a card that did that. And once you start to think of your world in cards, it's really, I mean, you look at every problem and you just say, mm, man, I'd love to have something that talks to my watch that does this, that. And those are surprisingly easy for a developer to whip up those kinds of things. What's surprisingly difficult is the developer who can make a card that lights up your Nest thermostat maybe doesn't have a good design aesthetic. Uh, and they don't want to solve the problem of a full distribution chain or a visualization uh, from a phone to a tablet, let alone they might not even know Android. Uh, and so how do you make it work over on Android or any of these other things? So completely remove all of that, let people do what they do best. And wh what's your business model going to be? Are you going to stick a ton of ads in here? Or that, how are you guys going to make money? No, I think there's a couple of ways. I think obviously for us, the most important thing is to grow the user base, uh, getting a lot of people onto the platform to build stuff. I think there's a whole separate track for businesses. And I think 
think you know you're Chevy uh, and you guys want to make a custom experience every dealership gets their own uh, custom experience uh, so when you walk into a Chevy dealership you've got uh, the ability to have an engaging experience just really quick and easy it doesn't make any sense when you look at how many dealerships the Chevy have across the United States like the thousands I'm guessing it doesn't make any sense to have thousands of Chevy apps you know for a Chevy in, in San Francisco you want one that's highly personalized and custom so uh, I think is that's this, where the, the is. this interesting to people? Yeah. 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 So, what kinds of cards would you want? Matt, I'd love to hear if you guys, yeah. Wellness dashboard. What's that? A wellness dashboard. A wellness dashboard. That's actually one of the That's actually one of the uh, things I'm into as well. So it's the I beacon Ah, uh, yes. We, that's one of the things that we showed off at the web, which was how do you not just connect to it, but I think you can do some really cool stuff with beacons, right? You can say, this beacon's mounted on this wall, and it's facing north, uh, and it's got a you know visibility like this. And so then when you walk up, maybe at the Louvre or at the museum, you can say, or at, most the, bike people, shop. Or at the bike shop, most people look stand exactly right here to get the perfect view of the Mona Lisa or the bike that folds into three parts or whatever it is right yeah I think we can do some really cool stuff I think that's that. really gonna be interesting for small businesses because they're they're needing to build uh, experiences for their employees or for their customers right this bike shop could have a, oh, a bike shop app easily right easy, on their phone easily and I think once you start to look at how, what you could do with that and it's not just the easy one of like I open you know I buy a, the I buy a black coffee every time I go to Starbucks and so it's automatically there okay that's kind of played out I think you could do a lot more interesting and a lot more engaging experiences yeah. as soon as we start to open up somebody's box are you doing any cards that are predictive that take data from a uh, you know your calendar and try to get predictive with all of the contextual apps that we're seeing so uh, I've been thinking we've been thinking about them as a team I think one of the problems with predictive is it's not right 100% of the time and when you start to make a consumer product uh, that doesn't work 100% of the time you have a problem because again we're looking look at the target Whereas as an early adopter I'm okay with that yeah I'm okay with Siri getting stuff wrong I'm okay with lots of stuff but uh, when I give it to somebody like a grandparent who's trying to use it and it gets it wrong, they get confused, it's not a good user experience. And so I, you know. But, but if Google now had an API, you could probably bring, bring that in as a card, right? Easily, yeah. And when you start to decompose, again, cards, it becomes a really powerful thing. Very cool. Yeah. Are you going to have payment systems? Because if this bike shop runs this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, runs a bike app on yeah. their, uh, on an Ailey, they probably want to take money and. Right buying stuff take some Bitcoin yeah. wouldn't it be cool though to have a channel where uh, we make a let's say you're big into fantasy league sports and one of our cards is, is a prop bet and so now during the game while you're watching you know whatever somebody versus somebody can say you can just type in a quick little message hey you know five bucks a guy misses the next you know field goal or whatever and then have that automatically transact so he goes through PayPal or, or whatever it is and those uh, facilitating that transaction I don't want a piece I don't want to get into the betting business but you know I do want to have a card that allows people to move money back and forth uh, so I think that's wow. a really powerful so you could have a Bitcoin card <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that would be yeah, really interesting. That would be interesting, huh? yeah. No, I think you can do some cool stuff, right? When you start to decompose the problem, really difficult problems, they become very easy once you start to uh, uh, to break them down into nice little cards. Very cool. Well, I hear the band. I hear band. I hear food. Well, no, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Smell food. Smell food. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I'll be around.